This time, on Colores. Former Pixar animator David Tart gives us a behind-the-scenes peek into what goes into an animated film. It takes quite a while. It takes anywhere between a week to two weeks to finish 10, 12 seconds of animation. Animator Tom Schroeder tells real-life stories that address issues including relationships, addiction, and survival. Story is very important to my films. The, the story is always the central motivating reason that I wanted to make the film. Writer-director of Zarkana, Francois Girard, reveals his inspiration for Cirque du Soleil's latest acrobatic spectacular. The set that you're seeing is reacting to the actual, not only the architecture of Radio City, but also the myths, the legends, the ghosts of Radio City. And we meet David Corins, the man responsible for creating Little Orphan Annie's world. Annie takes place in 1933 in New York City, um, in a very specific uh, point in American history. It's all ahead on Color. David Tart gives us insight into how an emotion can be conveyed through a gesture, giving an animated character life. So when we talk about animation, I think we have to start out with what the definition of animation is. And if you look this up in the dictionary, what you'll see is that it reads to bring life to. If we think about movement as opposed to animation, we can go outside in the natural world and or in the city and we can see a car driving by. And that's certainly moving. Um, we can look at wind blowing through the branches of a tree that's certainly moving, but we wouldn't necessarily say that it was alive. A rock being dropped on the ground, and bouncing to a stop, is definitely moving, but it's not animated. So really the quality of animation has to do with that term life, to bring life to. And when when we as human beings think about life, what we think about is personality, emotion, thought, basically a soul. When I'm animating a character, I have to think about the qualities of emotion, personality, situation, and how those things combine to cause a character to move in a certain way that when viewed by an audience will be taken for life. Communication between two people is largely about nonverbal signs. We pick up a lot more information out of the nonverbal cues. So animators are really, really interested in, in studying and quantifying and recreating those nonverbal cues, the movement essentially, that tells the story of life. Animators draw a lot from method acting, and method acting is basically where you, you put yourself into the imaginary circumstance of that character. So I have a character that's feeling defeated, and I have to go back in my emotional memory a little bit and find some situation in which I felt defeated. And then I also have to feel and recreate what it feels like to move from that feeling to being victorious. From that point, I have to internalize the performance, I have to act it out over and over again, and then I have to start analyzing it very specifically. We'll act something out 20, 30, 50 times, and then we'll start timing things out with a stopwatch. So I'm gonna do that simply by getting into the pose, and then going to my in pose. 
and making a note of how long that took. Because in animation and, and in communication in general, the posture, the overall posture is so important in communicating how that character is feeling. We don't want to take any shortcuts when it comes to examining that posture. We have the ability to continue to tweak it after we've acted it out, which gives animators really the opportunity to create performances and refine posing beyond that which a live actor could do. This is the roadmap. I will use this timing exactly, and we can look at that and how that looks in both stop motion and how that looks on the computer as well. Animation is extremely demanding, and especially when you're working on a feature film. There's directors involved, they want a specific performance, you're interacting and collaborating with a whole team of people. Uh, producers can change your performance or uh, change your shot at a moment's notice, and that can, that can get very tough. But the thing that keeps animators going and that keeps me going is this feeling of bringing something that doesn't exist to life. It's an amazing feeling. Ultimately, it boils down to sort of a Frankenstein complex. Initially, when we're creating characters, a lot of research goes into constructing a character that's believable. In the film, the story of animation, there are three main characters. The main protagonist is named Yu. We wanted him to represent any man. The other main character is the director, who works at the animation studio. And then the third uh, main character is the producer. For each of these characters, we had to come up with what's called a character bible so that we had something to go on to guide us and inform us and, and to give to the animators to guide and inform them how these characters might move, who they were, how old they are, what their body type is, what their dominant personality traits were. In doing this, we come up with a backstory um, where we give a character a psychological history. Animation is accomplished through a frame-by-frame -frame manipulation of a character and all the various parts on that character. And it takes quite a while. It takes anywhere between a week to two weeks to finish 10, 12 seconds of animation. For most people, the very idea of sitting in front of a computer or sitting on a stop motion stage and moving a character just a little bit at a time is enough to send them running for the doors. For animators, uh, for one reason or another, we just love this. The day in the life of an animator is filled with ups and downs, but there's always that fascination with the baseline movement and recreating that movement, and that's the common thread among animators. The thing that happens for me uh, that reminds me how much I love animation is that when I sit down to animate a shot and I'm getting lost in those details, how does this finger move? And I'm going forwards and backwards and forwards. <laughs> I'm watching this image go forwards and backwards over and over and over again. And I look up and I notice that three hours has passed. And it's that the degree that I can get lost in this, it reminds me just how, how much I love it. Tom Schroeder tells real life stories animated in an improvisational style that is influenced largely by jazz.
types of films that I've made tend to be subversive in nature. What do you do when your expectations don't work out? Rather than pursuing the hero's journey. My life, anyway, was an accumulation of things that didn't work out the way I hoped they would, and so I just started telling stories about people whose expectations didn't work out. Story is very important to my films. The, the story is always the central motivating reason that I wanted to make the film. Initially, when I started shooting animation with my friend in the barn, there was no sense that there should be an audience or could be an audience. This was just something we were doing for ourselves. And in, in, in a way, it was probably the happiest and purest period of my life in relationship to animation because it was so simple. When I was young and I was first interested in film, it was, it was live action filmmaking. I never fancied that I'd become an animator. Harvey Gustafson. I swear to you, if I hear you tell that horrible story one more time, even one more time in my presence, I'm moving straight in with Angie and Tom. Well, I guess I know then how to get my peace. <laughs> yeah. Riding with Harv is just a sort of character study about an old couple that have been married for, I think, 55 years, and they can barely stand each other's company anymore, but they, of course, couldn't live without each other. There's a couple different tendencies in the films that I've made. One is a film that's based off of a short story. Another type would be the documentary animated film tendency in which I'll uh, get a hold of some documentary audio footage and then base a film off of that. I was going out with this young girl named Carrie. I was feeling sad, you know, because I hadn't seen her in a long time. And I decided to ride my bike to her house. She lived in Malacca, which is about 48 miles away. And I didn't know how to get there, so I just looked it up on a map, and I found the, probably the longest way I could have taken. The film that I first had some success with was called Bike Ride in 2000. And that was one of the documentary-style films. A former student of mine told me the story of riding his bicycle 50 miles to see uh, his girlfriend getting dumped and then having to ride home. When I saw her, she didn't smile or anything, you know. I thought maybe she'd be happy to see me, like, wow, he rode five hours to see me. But there was nothing like that. I thought, how typical, you know, this great chivalric demonstration of one's affection. And, he, you know, he's riding his bike thinking of how impressed she's going to be. And then she has the opposite reaction. He's so crazy, he rode his bike 50 miles. My God, i got to get away from this guy. And she basically told me that she didn't want to be with me anymore. Uh, physically or whatever. I had um, Dave King, the drummer who plays for the Bad Plus, come in and improvise a uh, track to the to the story. That might have been one of the things that made her want to break up with me. I was just like, maybe too much. So it allows me to improvise in the drawing process and to create a style that's much more metamorphic. It flows much more by transformation as opposed to shot making in a traditional sense. So it opens up a different way of storytelling, which is nice as well. Music has always been a big part of my films. There is a parallel between drawing and playing guitar, for example, in the sense that I am improvising the drawing off of a map, off of the structure, and I'm letting the drawings go in a kind of flow of consciousness. In the same way playing guitar, you're working off of a structure, which is a series of chord changes, and you're trying to improvise something melodically meaningful on top of that. That happens in real time, but there is definitely a parallel between those processes and the flow of ideas. Before the digital drawing technology existed, uh, there was paper. And this is my previous film, Bike Race, some 4,000, 5,000 odd drawings uh, that comprise that 12-minute film archived in this box. One thing that might set my work apart from other animated films is that I am self-taught in terms of my, my drawing skills and my filmmaking skills. I've just learned by making films and by a lot of experimentation. I think a lot of what a person does uh, creatively is compensating for certain limitations and then finding their style in the space that exists outside of their technical limitations. So this is a film that I've just started working on called Marcel King of Tevuren, and I'm drawing for the first time a film on this new tablet, uh, which is a computer screen that I can draw on. 
Marcel is a rooster who's essentially and unfortunately acting out Greek tragedy with his son and his surroundings. One of the first things you do with a character to get your feeling for it is to do a cycle of locomotion, whether that's running or riding a bicycle or walking. Just this test right here represents a few days of work, maybe you know, 15 to 20 hours of work actually. Each film that I make takes about two years. I described animation as jokingly being like being in a sixth century Irish monastery doing um, illuminated manuscripts, like the human copying machine, just because it is so labor intensive and repetitive in a way. It's rather gratifying after a lot of work to see something come to life. People started saying, you know, your films seem like animated live action films, like you want to be making live action films. And I said, yeah, that's true. So I started sending them to live action festivals. And now I've been in Sundance a couple times and you get a lot of attention for that and a lot of access to people and uh, ideas and jobs as well. I hope that people that see my films will, f will feel that they see their own lives reflected in them, that there's some of the, the struggles and uh, joys and achievements and complications and ambiguities of life are there and that they can relate to them. And for me, it's always reassuring to find my own life in the films of other people. It makes me feel a part of something. Francois Girard shares the story behind Zarkana, the new show by Cirque du Soleil. Step up, folks, buy your ticket. Zarkana is depicting a circus family. We wanted to build a very clear sense of, uh, a very clear identity, and very early on I decided that the trapezists would be trapezists and the acrobats would play their own part. I'm Francois Girard, I'm the writer-director of Zarkana. I come from film, I would call film my home. I've been caught in theater for the past six or seven years, but uh, my background is mostly film. How did we come up with Zarkana? Like, it's actually a name that we consider to call it, uh, naming it Arcana. And then uh, the central character here, the ringmaster, Zark. I think Zark was named before we found Zarkana, like as the land of Zark. So it's, it comes from the, the main character. We named the main character first. And, and from Zark, we made Zarkana. Inspired by Radio City, where Zarkana debuted, Girard set the show inside an imagined version of the actual theater. Radio City was actually a great inspiration for the piece. The set that you're seeing is uh, reacting to the actual, not only the architecture of Radio City, but also the myths, the legends, the ghosts of Radio City. And, and we started there, but we also went back to the roots of the golden age of circus in the 30s, which coincides with the, the time that Radio City was built. So we're, we're telling the story of a, a show that was asleep and that wakes up to perform again a show that was lost in the past. The story revolves around Zark, a magician who goes on a quest to win back his lost love, regain his magic, and restore an abandoned theater to life. Zark is a... Um First, he's an old magician that comes back on stage in an abandoned theater, you know? And his goal is to give back life to this theater, to all the acrobats that are amazing, that they can do a lot of things that he doesn't remember, you know? With its strange and surreal video lighting and set design, the Zarkana stage comes alive, blurring the line between dream and reality. We're using video in a, a pretty interesting way where like, you never get to see exactly where the screens are, but you, we are, uh, through lighting and video and music, we are moving from one world to another. And then th this journey, I think, is a, a journey of high contrast. It's hard to uh, describe in one word what it is. In the back, it's so strange. It's so weird. You know, when you, you look at the decor, it's so... Um, uh, Tim Burton a little bit, you know, uh, Johnny Depp, uh, Listen to Wonderland. Zarkana's bizarre visual aesthetic carries over into its 250 costumes, also inspired by 1930s circus performers. I wanted this, these characters to look like a circus family. 
So we gave it a, 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 a weird spin, but it was fundamentally like trying to depict the circus characters. For Zarkana's music, writer-director Girard paid homage once again to the golden age of American circus. We inspired ourselves from the music of the time, from the 30s, from, and from the gospel, gospel music, I think, uh, played a role. We were deliberately trying to break away from the aesthetics uh, of, of circus and, and come up with a sound that was uh, a signature for this show. It's, it's more rock, it's more loud, but uh, I think in a very intelligent way. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, great vocals and great tunes. It takes live musicians to guide audiences across Zarkana's surreal landscape. Perched in two Eagles Head bandstands, the musicians are part of the action, playing right on stage with the performers. We would not be able to do that show in a way without live musicians. But with live musicians, you never know when, when the dynamics will come and <gasps> support, you know, as a singer, as a character, you know. Zarkana's soulful, haunting score, lush, high-tech set, and jaw-dropping acrobatics make it one of Cirque's most unique shows ever. I guess the, the most important thing that I try to achieve with this show with my collaborators is memorability. Uh, I think people walking out of the, of the theater will remember this as a unique experience. That's really what we're trying to do. I, I would say that it would be the only success, uh, true success, is that if people like live and experience in the theater and walk away and remember it as uh, years later, I think that would be, uh, would be the sign of success. The vision behind the sets and scenery in Annie the Musical, David Corrins, talks about what it takes to set the stage. Hi, my name is David Corrins and I'm the set designer for Annie. I basically create environments and scenery um, and total worlds for the stage. I read the play or a musical, listen to the music, and um, through a whole bunch of conversations with the director, the playwright, the composers, uh, we look at research, we build models, we do renderings, and through all of that process we wind up creating a stage environment. Annie takes place in 1933 in New York City um, in a very specific uh, point in American history where uh, the economy was down in the dumps, the president's approval rating was um, falling, and that the whole world really needs hope. And that is the trajectory that Annie takes. She goes from that Lower East Side grit to that Central Park um, fabulous palace. And it's, it's fun. I mean, it's a fun journey that she takes, um, and it's a fun journey that we get to take um, as a creative team in making that world. I work with a team of people um, every day in my studio with associates and assistants who help me be able to articulate to everyone that's going to eventually have to engineer and build the design. So we work with drafting, which is a technical drawing, sort of like architectural drawings. We work with building models, which are tools to talk to the scene shop, the people that are going to build the scenery. My process of designing a set is very heavily based in model making. We start in very, very rough white model form out of like paper and mat board and cardboard and whatever else we can find around the studio and kind of glue it all together. And then as the idea gets more and more refined, the models get more and more refined. We move slowly into color, we move slowly into like really refining the proportions and the line of the design. And it's important because nothing can really replace a scale replica of the thing that's going to show up on stage. If anyone is interested in becoming a set designer for the theater, I would think the number one thing they should learn how to do is communicate. Being able to draw and articulate and communicate with your hand is very important, but also being able to communicate with your voice and being able to explain to people what it is that is your particular take or a point of view on a story. It is all storytelling, whether it's visual storytelling or performance storytelling. Um, what I do every day is tell stories. We're making an Annie for 2012 and beyond, and it's such a, an honor to be given that challenge um, to do that. I'm, I'm also incredibly excited the fact that I have a seven-year-old, I will have a seven-year-old daughter when the show opens, so, um, and who's a huge fan of Annie, so to get to take her down the red carpet and see um, and be part of that production is really extra special.
next time on Colores. Navajo poet laureate Lucy Tapahanso shares how her poetry honors words. Things that a person says, that a person literally utters, is a sacred thing. Inspired by Rembrandt and Caravaggio, painter Luke Hilstead captures a strong sense of emotion. When I first started painting, I thought it'd be fun to do a bunch of paintings of my friends in hoodies and jeans. And then I tried to experiment to see what it would, what it would take to make things that look like they could be from any century. Swedish artist Gunilla Klingberg uses company logos to create intricate patterns. I'm interested in the combination to clash the iconography taken from the Western world, consumer world, with this image which resembles of a sacred mandala. Jaden Moore takes mementos from the early 20th century and reassembles them into beautiful artworks. I'm interested in having these things, cutting them apart, giving them a new history, a new aesthetic. Until next time, thank you for watching.